For a genre that's pretty apparent and rife for MMOs, the pirate MMO is a decidedly uncommon theme. Sure, I'm positive their canon will be plenty of people to point out the numerous titles featuring pirates or naval combat, but very few are well-known titles, unless you count Archage, which I don't. So what possessed us to choose this title over the dozens of choices available? It's the only one that still seems to be kicking. After looking at a few other options, this title was one of the few with a recent update as of May, letting us know that at least it wasn't completely dead in the water. Ha, I did that on purpose. So, enough random excuses. This is the MMO Grinder, and it's time to set sail with Pirates of the Burning Sea. Yar! Pirates of the Burning Sea! <clears throat> Pirates of the Burning Sea is a 3D world-style MMO with both ground and naval combat options. Started in 2008, the game's age shines through, but there is a bit of charm to be had here. More so when you realize the game's toted and oft-used initialism can be pronounced pot BS. Formerly under development by Flying Lab Software, something they never bothered to remove or update on the loading screen, and originally published by good old SOE, now known as Daybreak Games. The game was announced to be shut down by SOE in January of 2013, so a few members of Flying Lab Software formed Portalis Games, and picked up Pirates of the Burning Sea, where they now continue publication and development-ish. This isn't exactly boding well for the game, despite it holding on as long as it has, but let's look inside and see what's going on. This is another one of those situations where a game originally looked fantastic when it was first launched, but has aged less than gracefully. There's a reason games like World of Warcraft or movies like Toy Story seem timeless, as a deliberate choice of focusing on an aesthetic and theme, as opposed to realistic graphics for the time, allows a game to keep its charm, while the realistic graphics will always become dated the moment a better engine becomes available. There are good ideas here, which we'll get into at the end of this section, but this is a game that has that particularly outdated feel that can bring down the entire experience. The amusing part about this aged feel is that the game doesn't even come with everything you need in its own installer. Yes, the installer will tell you that it didn't install everything, and that you need to go and get that legacy PhysX driver from a separate website. To be honest, we have no idea what PhysX could possibly be used for in this game, but if it's necessary to play, then you're gonna have to bite the bullet. The animation quality leaves a lot to be desired as well, and certainly doesn't do the game any favors. Be prepared to witness the most jittery, randomly starting and stopping animation cycles ever put into a game, with a hilarious mention going out to the dance of our people. Fights between ground combatants have some unintentional hilarity thrown into the mix as opponents will sprint directly at you, but will be sliding backwards because none of the developers seem to know how this programming worked. Kinda of surprised this still has yet to be taken care of, and while it's a mere annoyance for a few of us, it does undermine any sense of realism the game's graphics were trying to portray. What also faults the game is a lack of impact in this combat, both in ground and ship combat. In ground combat, sword slashes don't have any weight behind them unless they're that satisfying final blow. Pistol shots are nothing but a Capcom pop and a miming motion unless it's the last hit, which turns the weak looking shot into a brutal impact looking blast when your enemy falls to the ground with a spray of blood. It's really odd. Ship combat also falls victim to this, but to a lesser extent. When the cannon fire barely registers as going off and silently sails over to the enemy ship, only causing visible impact to the other ship with a series of HP stats ticking away from that ship, it feels more like you're spraying numbers at each other. What helps to impress me, however, is the fact that damage occurring to your ship is done in real time. There is a stunning amount of detail in the ship combat. Zoom in close enough to your ship or your enemies and you'll see individual crew members working the mast or the cannons as your player character oversees them. Crew taking fire can be knocked to the deck or even tossed overboard. Using the sail or mass damaging ammunition will tear holes in the opponent's sails and even topple their masts. Regular shots will pepper the side of your hull with holes. It's all very impressive for what it does, but unfortunately the game's age does not lend to the feeling like you're causing that amount of damage. Just imagine something like this on a more modern engine and there's great potential here. Same old song and dance for anybody who's been watching recent episodes, but the game's immediate tutorial that takes place after your character creation will blow out your speakers if you play one of the national factions, and it'll only give you a slight warning as a pirate. Seriously, developers, stop it. Though it was amusing to listen to every single Grindstone member start that tutorial and immediately crowd out various expletives before shutting off their speakers. There won't be much to talk about when it comes to music, as it is artfully made, but still you're expected pirate theme tunes. 
They play all too rarely in the game and leave you with major downtime of nothing but lapping water and standard oceanscapes. This is easily another case of bring your own soundtrack, with a huge recommendation to use the sea shanties from Assassin's Creed 4, as it not only fit the world, but makes some of the open world sailing feel more enjoyable. You know, that or the Wind Waker theme. Just trust me when I say that that could be a requirement, but we'll get into that when we talk about gameplay. So you may be wondering why we didn't suggest the Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack. Well, don't worry, as you won't need to bring any Hans Zimmer to this party, as the game does it for you. It's well composed, sure, and works better outside of the game if you just listen to it, but some of you might notice that many of the tracks seem to have sets and stanzas heavily reminiscent of Pirates of the Caribbean. If we were being cynical, we'd say the composer was probably tasked with a deliberate attempt to cash in on the success of that film franchise, but keep in mind this game was released before the fourth film nearly wrecked that series. A serious lack of attention carries over to the sound effects, though, which, as previously mentioned, sound pitifully weak or unnaturally delayed from the actions that you're performing. Want to fire off a massive 14 cannon broadside? Be met with a thunderous roar of bubble wrap being popped. Like cutting up some scurvy dogs that affront you? Listen to the beautiful sound of a wood plank slapping against a hay bale. Want to hear that satisfying thwump of a flintlock and deep thud as it embeds an iron ball into the flesh? Be greeted by the frightful sound of every preteen cowboy's cap gun revolver made in the 90s. Yar. It is very unfortunate this game is such a lackluster work put into it, but lackluster work isn't a problem limited to this area, so we may as well cross that bridge now. Starting out the game, you'll be treated to a rather dated and frankly odd-looking launcher. You might also have to deal with an odd loading issue, and many of our first forays into the game were met with the launcher claiming that it was updated, the play game button was grayed out, and around a minute of nothingness until the game suddenly decided that we'd waited long enough. Subsequent visits to the game seem to fix this problem, but as they say, watch that first step, it's a doozy. You're asked to choose your country allegiance when starting out, and have the option of the French, Spanish, British, and the Pirates. The nation factions have the options of playing a few classes, a naval officer, privateer, and free trader. Naval officers get the heaviest firepower, privateers get the ability to scout and disable enemy ships, and free traders are exactly what they say on the tin. Tons of cargo space to play as a trader amongst the high seas, but not exactly the best equipped to deal with all those ne'er-do-wells, looking to loot them for all their worth. So want to be that someone who loots the free traders for all their worth? Choose one of the two classes in the pirate faction, cutthroats or buccaneers. Cutthroats have the option of overtaking and capturing enemy ships once they've reached derelict status, either by being overtaken during a boarding, or damaged to the point of having the crew abandon ship. Buccaneers obtain new ships by salvaging derelict ship for a much higher chance at getting a deed to the ship, which can be traded and sold or used to obtain a new ship. Basically, you're better off being a cutthroat if you just plan on hijacking the Caribbean. Once you choose a faction, you are stuck on that faction. Even if you delete the character, every character on your account, You'll only be given the option for that faction that you chose, so make it count. Or you can just sign up for a new account with a new email. It doesn't even have to be a real email address. As long as there's an at sign and a period, you're set. As you can imagine, this makes alt a mildly complicated but absurdly common practice in this game by letting you create as many counts as you want. We started by playing the British, as the life of a privateer sounded appealing, seizing ships for king and country and all that. The problem was that this isn't how the game actually worked when it came to being a privateer. Instead of being granted the ship for use, and thus ensuring privateers have a steady increase in power as they level, they're granted a pitiful amount of loot and a pat on the head, while their scurvy dog counterparts not only get to keep the ship, but also get extra loot and benefits in PvP. The long and short of it is, while privateer sounds interesting on paper and has more roleplay opportunities, they're simply just worse off than pirates. So with such a lacking campaign, frustrations at acquiring new ships for any of our bridge captains, and looking up what other factions played like, we caved in and made new accounts to be the scurvy dog of the Caribbean. That simple change made an enormous difference, as we were able to constantly upgrade our ships to either keep pace or most likely outpace the progression of the story, and giving us good equipment to engage various NPC fleets that were normally far outside our level. In short, the game went from being a boring, tedious, and frustrating grind, to try to keep your head above the absolutely destroyed economy, into a game we were actually having fun playing, with nary a care for the auction house, outside of buying some more absurd ammunition to ruin some poor fleet's day. Now, there are some benefits to being a national, mostly in that the ships you obtain will have extra durability points, so being sunk will not be as much of a detriment since you'll be given a few defeats in battle before you lose that ship entirely. And the pirates only have one go. However, considering pirate players can easily steal another ship every two hours, it makes the choice almost moot. Once you've made your faction choice, you'll be thrown into the previously mentioned tutorial to begin learning the ins and outs of combat within the Burning Sea. 
Here, you'll immediately notice that the game has some amusing tank-like controls, where pressing A or D for more than a millisecond will spend your character spinning, and where mouse steering feels incredibly sluggish. We highly recommend going into the options to increase the sensitivity of the mouse to max and using it to help steer your character, as it'll generally make navigation on foot far simpler of a task. Beyond that, you'll be introduced to the ground combat, which runs off a Sato stamina system for specialty attacks, loaded flintlocks for your pistol-based attacks, or very simple spammables if your opponent either can't be hit from status effects or you need attacks that don't drain your stamina. This is one of the first major complaints, as while the system is rather well thought out, it ends up being tedious and doesn't really feel like you're actually fighting someone. It's another case where it feels more like you're slapping someone with numbers until they run out and fall over, while also maneuvering in a very clunky and jittery way to line up cleaves and AoE attacks. This becomes a major problem, as it's a vital part of the game's entire gameplay, and if this feels so tedious and boring, then it'll make the numerous quests and boarding actions feel tedious and boring. After completing your ground combat tutorial on the deck of the ship, you'll then be tasked with taking command and beginning the naval combat section. Here the game does feel much better, as it controls intuitively, and it's probably the single most common thing that you'll be doing. Big shocker, right? Pirate MMO is a large focus on naval combat. To get your ship in motion, simply let loose your sails with the W key, unfurling them and allowing them to catch the wind, here represented by a red marker on the dial around your ship. If you want to slow your speed, perhaps to keep a limping enemy ship in your broadside's firing arc, simply use S to draw your sails back up at a steady rate. The dial will also represent what facing will give you the best forward momentum, with green having the largest noticeable boost, and yellow being moderate, while the previously mentioned red will have you moving forward at a snail's pace, and also massively reduces turning speeds accomplished by the rudder with A or D. Once you get your head around the movement system, it's time to learn how to actually fight during the Age of Sail. To accomplish this, there's various armaments on your ship, with different ships having different configurations and poundage of their guns. Firstly, you have your swivel guns, again with various configurations and poundages that have 180 degree firing arcs to the port and starboard side of your ship, but of very limited range. Really, they're mostly useful for picking off enemy crewmen to try to cause panic, or getting in a couple more close range shots when the big guns are loading. Secondly, the aforementioned big guns come into play, and if you've seen any Age of Sail style media in the past several decades, you know exactly what this means. Sadly, the starter ship won't come off with many full cannons, but at least you can eventually work up to the massive warships, and even first-rate ships with a line of a hundred or more guns. The other real shame is that the audio doesn't do what by all means would feel like being on the receiving end of Hellfire, anywhere near the amount of justice that it deserves. During a broadside, the type of ammunition you load will have an effect not only on the exact firing arc of the cannons, but what those cannons will do to the enemy ship. You're also affected by the poundage of the guns, with 6-pounder being reloaded rather quickly, while the massive 24-pounder guns will take exceptionally longer to make up for that in raw damage. To change what type of ammunition is loaded, simply right-click on the ammunition icon for the appropriate side of the ship that you wish to load, with multiple decks having different slots for each allowing you to mix and match ammunition on larger ships. The first type of ammo is round shot, a typical ammo that everyone thinks of when firing cannons, which has a good penetrative quality and high damage against structure, but does less damage to the crew or the sails. The second type is known as dismantling shot. This is where bar shot, chain shot, and star shot will come into play, and they're designed to smash their way through the mast through entangled rigging and rip apart sails. The final type is known as the anti-personnel shot, which includes langridge, shoving whatever middle bits and bobs into a cannon that you can find, canister shot, which holds several medium-sized balls in a long canister, and grape shot, which would turn your cannons into a massive shotgun with hundreds of pellets each and will all easily destroy an enemy's crew. When it comes to being a pirate, we would recommend using straight round shot, unless the game specifically calls for defeating an enemy in a boarding action, which can be eased by destroying all their masts and thinning out their crew first. Speaking of boarding, this is accomplished by getting within 50 meters of an enemy boat, slowing both yourself and that enemy ship to an almost standstill, and then selecting the boarding ability and attempt to hook onto the other ship. Your chance of success will be reflected in the color of the boarding ability, green being 100%, yellow ranging from 80 down to 40%, and being physically unable if it's grayed out. Once you've successfully boarded, you'll be taking the ground combat on the enemy's deck. The more crew you have, the more reinforcement waves that you can summon, which will represent your captain's lives, and reinforcing crew members should you call them in. Regardless of how low we've managed to get an enemy's crew, they will always seem to have four waves of reinforcements. Three to be used and one automatically at the start of battle, even if their reported crew during boarding was only three people. However, if you leave them with a full crew, or you yourself invade with a massive crew, you can expect to see waves of six or more in the battle, making it highly recommended just whittle down the enemy with anti-personnel cannon shots before you take on the fight. You can also perform a boarding action on the fort, but don't get excited, as it's literally the exact same thing with different backdrop, rather than requiring special mechanics, or even needing you to assault sections of that fort first. 
Note that when you invade the fort, the enemy will leave the drawbridge down and leave all the doors wide open because they failed basic siege defense. This leads us into another major issue, as the AI for this game is incredibly thick. Not only is the programming noticeably off, but don't be surprised if allied NPCs, especially ones that you're required to escort on the open sea or land, will run off by themselves at Mach 10 to go ham on the entire enemy army. This also becomes comical when you attempt to rush at an enemy group and watch them snap into specific positions at your perimeter and then just sprint backwards to keep up with you until you finally stop running, regardless of how many walls, trees, or bushes they get shoved through. This means to actually engage the enemy, you need to run at them, then come to a complete halt before the game will finally allow them to approach you for combat. But don't be surprised if the AI causes them to run through you and snap to a predetermined spot in an awkward angle. While not every member of Grindstone had suicidal NPC syndrome, there were enough complaints and restarted missions to make it a serious issue. Said missions or quests, if you prefer, are also very generic and follow a noticeable and very tedious pattern. Expect to see a lot of three enemy ships that need to be beaten, or three enemy ships and one that needs to be boarded, or an enemy fleet of three ships that all must be destroyed. And you begin to see the issue with questing. It gets exacerbated when so many missions take place in copy-pasted locations. If you've seen one jungle encampment, you have seen them all, and this carries over to all the hidden smuggler caves, beach encampments, warehouses, taverns, auction houses, houses, and manors. There's some interesting concept to the questing, though, as this game actually offers consequences and choices. This is somewhat undermined by the fact that every faction does the exact same quests, but it is interesting to see that you can interrupt an enemy's rant by just shooting him in the face with a flintlock, or talk your way past several really tough encounters, even gain some allies for later missions. Though, even with these, the theme park-style quest ride in this MMO isn't very enjoyable, or memorable, and you're far better off just going sandbox-style by hitting the high seas to attack the various convoys, warships, pirates, and privateers out in the Caribbean. To get the open sea, just simply find the longboat coxswain who will help you get to your ship and select the open sea option. You'll then be taken to the world map, which uses a system players of Mountain Blade would be very familiar with, still though requiring you to actually sail and use the wind currents like normal. While out here you'll notice ships coming and going everywhere, with information about their faction, ship type, levels, and number of ships within each group should you click on them. Do be warned though that if a group has numbers that indicate that there's more ships, it doesn't mean that they'll be the same ship, or even the same level of ship representing the leader. On more than one occasion, Grindstone has jumped a national merchant convoy of level 30 and found out that when we got into battle, it was being escorted by a level 45 Mastercraft warship. We should also note that the things like Obsolete or Mastercraft will give you a hint about how good that ship is, Obsolete being weaker variants of the ship and Mastercraft being an alarm bell that needs to be focused down quickly or you're in for a world of hurt. There is a major issue here, though. The game is a very nasty memory leak that can corrupt the open sea world and make maps unreadable and the entire landscape unbearable to look at. The issue is so common that the community oft complains about it in chat, and it apparently has been an issue for a very long time. Some have found that changing the texture settings from max to something lower actually prevented this particularly nasty and crash-happy memory leak, but it's distressing to see such an issue has not been taken care of yet. The game also tries to be unique with its crafting system, or here is known as the economy system. The idea is solid, though poorly executed within the best of intentions, wanting to force people to team up and set up trade routes with each other within societies to allow for full use of the system. To get started, you first need to buy a warehouse in an appropriate dock, acquire a structure deed, and use a resource provided by said dock before you can begin manufacturing raw materials to go into yet another structure to be produced into a finished good. The more advanced the manufacturing, the more types of raw materials that you'll need, which is limited greatly per account to facilitate trade and is the major reason some players have 80 plus alternative accounts just to mitigate the absurd economy. While that number is on the high end of the bell curve, many players will fully admit that they have at least 30 alternate accounts so they don't have to get screwed over by overpriced auction houses, and can focus on supplying their main account with materials for shipbuilding, ammunition, and consumables. So why would so many people make alternate accounts instead of trying to work with others in the community to get into a simple and stable supply chain? Well, let's get into that. This community is unique in many ways compared to most MMOs out there. This is simultaneously a good thing, a bad thing, a terrible thing, and the most confusing thing that we'd ever seen. You know, sometimes chat will get a few random trolls or people screaming racial obscenities at the drop of a hat? Yeah, that happens here a lot, however, in a very odd twist, those same exact people will turn out to be the most helpful, polite, and well-mannered people when requesting assistance or asking a question. Once your question's been satisfied, they'll immediately turn back to requesting that every other player should kill themselves, their family, and any pets that they may have in the most openly hostile and disgusting manner possible. This community has some serious schizophrenia issues, more so than any other game that I've ever experienced. 
Don't be surprised if you see a massive rant about how people in the military are stupid and going to hell, while the Frenchy frog should learn to bathe and shave before offing themselves for being cowards. Immediately following said rant, they will move naturally into a conversation about what food they like to eat and where they enjoy spending their free time. We have no idea how to better explain this. The community is so helpful when called upon for assistance, and yet so repulsive at most other times, so just use your best discretion. The game also follows that recent trend and has a rather sparse community within the game, with both servers having light loads in every faction and chats revolving around a few names. While there's more activity here than in Black Old or Alods, it can be disheartening to see so relatively few people roaming around the Caribbean. There's a rumor that the game will be coming to Steam, which would increase the population for a while, but no one could ever give us a clear post from the devs if this was even true, or even still in the works. So what can you do as a community within Burning Sea? Well, a surprising amount of stuff. Perhaps you want to do the standard PvP by flagging yourself to be attacked in the open sea. Or maybe even pushing a port into unrest and triggering a massive pirate PvP zone surrounding a small national PvP ring. That pirate PvP ring is actually a very large advantage for pirate players. As while you might think it would be all nationals versus pirates, it's actually more of a four-way free-for-all, and these specific PvP rings can mean a pirate can force national players into combat regardless of their PvP flagged status. You can always team up with other friendly players in fleets of six to go about the high seas and attacking all enemy factions to gain loot and experience. Or maybe team up to form a society that can be used to take on actual control of a port for defense and tax purposes on behalf of your chosen faction. Do note that if you want to make your own society for you and your friends, you'll need to spend at least $6 on the game. So yes, here we have another game that requires real money to form up something unique with your friends. And while you do get some decent benefits from this, you'll likely find better options in the cash shop. Of course, this is one of those games. The very first issue to take note of here is that the cash shop doesn't give you all the information you need to make a purchase right away. As an example, you'll notice that the cash shop, known as the Treasure Isle, uses Burning Sea points, but you aren't allowed to purchase Burning Sea points, and instead you're told that you'll buy Burning Sea notes. The reason for this is that you can list Burning Sea notes on the auction house, and they usually go for absurd amounts of doubloons in excess of 1 million. But if you use the item, you'll be given 300 Burning Sea points. This means that spending $3 will get you 300 BSP. One Burning Sea note costs $3, so 300 BSP for 3 bucks, 6 will get you 600, and so on. Though you can find small sales on Burning Sea notes to get them a bit cheaper than the 1 to 100 ratio that noted here. The prices in this shop are all over the place, ranging from alright to downright absurd, so it'll really come down to each individual on how they feel about the pricing. So what can you get for a bit of dosh within the treasure aisle? First and foremost, you have the typical cosmetic items, such as hats, coats, tattoos, pipes for smoking, and originally various sail designs that were submitted by the community itself. But this feature seems to have been dropped, and it's nowhere to be seen. There's also two different slots for pets, one that can sit on your shoulder, and another that can follow you around while you play. You'll find the usual booster packs in here as well, giving you a quick boost to your doubloons earned, experience gained, and faction loyalty and loot. Past here, though, is where we get into a very sticky issue, as the game is very much a pay-to-win title. So much so that even the community actively playing and enjoying the game will chime in for how much it sucks and how they're sick of it. For example, your burning sea points could be spent on buying NPC allies to use in battles, both on land and sea. But thankfully not allowed within the PvP zones, which helps smooth over the random difficulty spikes throughout. You can choose to buy special powder types that'll increase your reload speed, attack damage, or accuracy and make your ship flat out better than anyone else's. There are various repair kits tucked in here as well that can be purchased to make fixing your ship's mid-combat extremely easy. Or perhaps you just want to buy a couple lucky coins to increase your open sea traversal speed. This big issue comes into play when you realize that you can purchase ships straight from the cash shop regardless of the ship's rarity within the game. To a pirate this won't mean as much, even with a lack of durability, which all cash shop ships have. You can simply target another ship to steal. However, a national player who has to work far harder to grind up doubloons or materials to get their version, you can't help but feel like you're being cheated. As previously mentioned as well, it also feels like they want you to pay money to keep up with the power curve in this game, to actually make the starting experience more enjoyable. You can also purchase rare materials or writs from the cash shop to make getting some of the best ships in the game far easier than normal. Another surprising aspect is having the ability to store ships that you might like to keep but don't want to clutter your dockyard for is also a pay-to-only feature. Not that you would be aware of this until the first time you try to use the service and are met with instructions to either buy the right for real cash or subscribe to the game. Perhaps there's a way to get more dockyard slots then, right? Well, again, if you want additional dockyard slots to lift the rather harsh two-ship limit, you'll need to spend some real money for the privilege. And in a game that wants you to acquire more and more ships in case you happen to lose one in battle, this really stings. 
However, the economy system is where the pay-to-win argument seems to hold the most water, as being a free player will see your economic slots incredibly limited, and thus encouraging the abuse of the lax account system. See, the game's economy is absolutely shot, with exorbitant prices on everything that'll make new players, or those with smaller economies, unable to compete with people who are either paying cash to lift slot restrictions or just abusing the account system. You can choose to buy several types of deeds as well, or even free warehouses to build on islands and cut out the construction costs altogether. Last but not least is the ability to purchase treasure maps and missions from the cash shop, and that ubiquitous annoyance of the lucky box. So with a cash shop that feels awkward, looks dated, and along with several links that'll lead to 404 pages, why would you ever risk dropping cash on the title? In all honesty though, this cash shop is just one poor idea, side by side with other poor ideas that can tarnish the uniqueness of this title. Whether it be the age showing, the lack of new developer support, the broken connections to its past host, or the overall lackluster presentation, we started to feel the weight of this game pretty fast, but there was something really interesting about the whole thing that just kept us going for a good while. Sure, the game's economy is so far in the crapper it would make a capitalist robber baron feel secondhand embarrassment, but there's just something about taking to the open seas to loot and plunder hapless merchant ships that had us coming back for a while. As flawed as this game is, it's got a good base going, and if these features were polished up, balanced out, and given a lot more weight and impact, there's definitely a good game to be had with all of this, if a developer were to run with a concept and put some money and effort behind it. We're just not sure it's going to last in this game. Here's my final rating. Combat in this game, at least on the sea, can be very interesting and complex. Knowing exactly when to fire, what to fire, the best way to position yourself, whether or not to board, it all comes together to make each skirmish upon the ocean feel different even if the game itself doesn't fully render that feeling well, but that's its own point to be made in a different category. The feeling of free sailing will sit well with the explorer types, and getting to travel the Caribbean, while on the lookout for pirates or potential targets, makes the game all the more open feeling, allowing you to approach the title in both a theme park and a sandbox manner, and not forcing you into doing either first is a nice touch. Like other games Grindstone and I have had a fond appreciation for, this game takes a lot more risks and didn't bother going with a safe formula like so many other games were doing around its inception. It might just be different enough to hook you. Money definitely has its uses in this kind of title, and it shows here. However, the most useful but least impactful to others options would lie in getting extra storage, especially if you're a pirate looking to amass a small fleet and make up for your one-and-done ship defeat penalty. Of course, you can't have a former subscription game without a subscription option, and with the paid restrictions, it's obvious what they think is the best bang for your buck. It does alleviate a lot of those restrictions, but it's your call if you'd rather just get a few perks unlocked permanently. Odd that this is the second game in a row that requires you to pay for the privilege of getting a guild, and to counter a common argument that was made, yes, you can join someone else's for free, but making guilds with friends is part of the charm of this genre, for a lot of people. It just doesn't feel right to be forced to pay for it with real money and I thought the charter system was archaic. Yeah, it's old. It looks old. It plays old. There's ugly graphics issues with an ugly interface, and the game has not aged well at all. For some, that's an immediate red flag, but while I personally don't agree with the assessment, and I think plenty of pretty games are absolute trash, I can see where this gets in the way for people regarding this game. Audio doesn't back up the impact of combat at all. Quests feel dull and repetitive, and progression is a slow grind no matter how you tackle it. The combat is, again, pretty rough around the edges, and many members of Grindstone would prefer to keep firing on a ship to destroy it rather than attempt to board it just because they'd prefer not to deal with the wonky ground combat and buggy NPC AI. It's definitely a sore spot on the game compared to what we know can be done with this kind of combat. The community is a real point of contention, one where I was pretty dead set on not listing them in the past point, but co-writer Dresker certainly was insistent. The chats are an echo chamber of terrible behavior, and plenty of the worst in internet culture makes frequent appearance. But the very same people who spent the past few sentences making Facebook fan pages sound like a science symposium will turn around and delightfully assist you with questions and confusions that you may have without a hint of sarcasm or belittlement. It's really weird. I suppose you can get the help you need, but there's just a lot of awful to go around. So take this as a tentative pass from me. Depends on how much you really need to rely on the chat or your willingness to read it. Finally, this game feels like it's on its last legs. Oh, sure, there have been updates, recent updates, but considering the game's been in this dev's hands since 2013, and the most we've seen is an economy rebalance that the community feels made matters so much more worse, and the promise of implemented forums that still haven't been completed, it's difficult to see this lasting the test of time. Again, it's a great concept, but it might be time for the right people to leave this sinking ship and look to build a new one.
Next time, I tackle a subgenre that I haven't touched before, so hopefully I picked the right one. I probably didn't. I have got to stop forgetting to do this. Well, let's start off simple by saying if you liked what you saw for whatever reason, you can keep updated by subscribing. You can find out even more by visiting my site at mmogrinder.net, where I'm planning on putting out some articles to let everyone know what I really feel about a game. Since that's an oddly common comment from people who don't really get what I'm trying to do here, that should cause some lovely comment wars. If you care to see the previous episode on Star Conflict, because, like, not many people did, you can click that image on the left. If you're interested in my first impressions of Blizzard's Heroes of the Storm, you can check my side quest video on the right and get a good idea of what it's about, unless you're the kind of person who thinks Jim Raynor and Tyka Spindley are the same person. Then your mind's probably made up. Yes, my inside jokes are so mysterious. Shoutouts are once again a solo project, as Patreon supporters would normally rather just support the show and not take advantage of their perks. Yeah, I don't get it either. Slipstream is back from his hiatus and hosting Grindstone's game server, so once again he should be ready for streaming over at his Twitch channel at twitch.tv forward slash slipstreamx14. You can also keep up with his game project blog over at mindofthenewbiedev.tumblr.com. The extra emphasis on the Tumblr is because I forgot to call it that last time. I'm super professional up in this bitch. 